baptizer appeared in the wilderness. Baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me, and I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. You're welcome to be seated. I knew today would be snowy, so I have prepared a more visual sermon than usual. If you are worshiping through Zoom, you'll see that come up through a slideshow. And if you're here, I hope you got one of the uh, little packets with the pictures on it. Right. Uh, you know, look down as you as you desire. Today is the feast of the baptism of our Lord. It is one of the four baptismal feasts of the church year. The others being... It's a fun pop quiz for you. You can unmute if you're online too. Easter, Pentecost, all saints, all saints, Easter, Pentecost, all saints, and baptism of our Lord. And these days when we've seen a special connection of the moment of liturgical commemoration with baptism, and these are the days when we especially celebrate baptisms. Uh, so to enter this, uh, with some visual support. Uh, here is a Coptic Christian icon of Jesus rising up out of the Jordan River as he's baptized by John. Now, the, the Jordan River is a real river, right? It's an actual place on earth. Still, still exists, still called the Jordan River. It's between the territories of Palestine and Jordan. And you can still go there. You can still go into the waters. People still go there even for baptisms. Um, so John was at a real place. We could, if you look at the next uh, image, we, we could just show you a picture of some people that look like what Jesus and John might have looked like standing in the river. Um, but my aim today in showing you some images is not to give you realism. Uh, it's to share and explore how art may help us lean into, live into our baptism and get closer to our relationship with God. And so if we go, because, you know, on a baptismal feast day, even though there's no baptism today in our community, we'll still renew our baptismal vows in a few minutes. Uh, and so moving back to the, the Coptic icon, uh, this image is not realistic, but it actually contains more of the story. And in that sense, this image may be as much or more, more real than a photograph. So as you see this image, what catches your eye? Well, just what stands out to you when you first look? They believed in immersion in those days. Yeah, it, the scripture says, as he was coming up out of the water, which means he went down into the water. So here comes Jesus coming up out. Great. What else What else stands out to you? A bunch of angels. Oh, I can hear. Randy, what, what's being said? I think that speaker might not be turned up. 
angels, the presence of angels, which was not in the passage we read today, nor is it in any of them that there are angels at his baptism, but immediately after his baptism, he's driven into the wilderness. He goes into the wilderness to fast for 40 days where it says the angels attended him. So in this image, you have the moment of Jesus's baptism, but it's also giving you the next piece of the story. It's connecting multiple pieces of his, his life. What else? The dove. About the little red boxes. You want, maybe, is that speaker, can that go up anymore, I wonder? that I can Because I can hear, but just not quite loud enough. Uh, Paul, you're saying John's staff, John the Baptist's staff, has a cross on it, which at the moment of Jesus' baptism is not yet a sign of victory. <laughs> um, it's a sign of death and execution. But what the painter is doing is pre-shadowing that Jesus' baptism will lead him uh, up to the cross. The, the worshiping catfish, someone pointed out. Oh, it, I, I was surprised by these. These really drew me in, in this image because it to me, I mean, obviously Jesus was baptized in water, but the presence of the fish in the water made me remind reminded me that it's it's the waters of all creation the water inherently connects us to all the created order and so i i mean you may you may see something different in the fish but they kind of drew me out to the living water why does the first angel have a sort of staff sticking into the water why i don't i don't know the answer to that question i i also wondered that is the is the angel troubling the waters which connects to some other text you know troubling as in stirring making bringing them alive i um i think it's a fishing line Michael. someone yeah. at 8 a.m suggested that if some of the angels are ready to towel jesus off then this angel is ready to yank him out mm -hmm. um <laughs> i i truly don't know the the meaning of the staff I think it's the Archangel Michael who has a sword. Okay. Thank you. It like a it doesn't look like a sword to me. No, it's a weapon. <laughs> mm -hmm. So so this icon, see all these, see all these layers, they connect the moment of Jesus' baptism with the rest of his life. And I've often talked with you about that. How the Baptism as, I mean, in John's gospel, it's, I mean, in Mark's gospel, where we are today, immediately you are at the baptism of Jesus. That's that's your inauguration of the good news of Jesus Christ, because he lives for 30 years, and then suddenly his public ministry, this vibrant, life-giving public ministry is inaugurated at this moment when Jesus is affirmed or Perhaps it's revealed more fully that he is God's child, the beloved. And he hears that and stands up into that and spends 40 days in the wilderness absorbing that truth and then goes into this public ministry. These pieces of art do some of that connecting work. They see the bridge from his baptism to his going into the wilderness to the cross and I started thinking then of other images from the Christian tradition and noticed some connections I hadn't seen before. So this next one is called Our Lady of the Sign. It's named that way um, for the scripture that says, the Lord will give you a sign. The virgin shall bear a son and you shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. It depicts Jesus in Mary's womb her arms are lifted up in, and some of the very earliest uh, art that we can see in houses that were retrofitted into churches uh, depicts that Oron's position, O-R-A-N-S, the Oron's position, um, this welcoming posture. And here is Mary taking this posture of openness and receptivity to what God is doing in her with this unexpected child. And, uh, and I want to acknowledge, you know, Eastern icons may not be for everyone as an art style. Uh, I know that because you've told me, um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but what, what it draws me to them 
is both they have both the the kind of marvelous and the hilarious in one place right because here is jesus almost this kind of fully formed looking jesus with a scroll in one hand and already with his other hand in a, in a blessing posture um but still in the womb and so you get again the layers uh, of jesus's life here so mary's uterus Okay. we can we can talk we can say uterus in church right you all y'all can handle that <laughs> um mary's uterus her e even we could say her amniotic sac here is depicted as a field of stars and rays of light there's a, a connection here between a very biological thing happening and a cosmic thing happening mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and actually, uh, one, one of our worshipers at 8am, who's also an art historian pointed out to me something I didn't know, which is that blue pigment could only be gotten from a couple of mines mm -hmm. in Afghanistan where they mined lapis lazuli. And then it came <laughs> along the silk road to get to the mm -hmm. West. And until Prussian blue was invented in the 1800s, this was the, the blue was the most rare, most expensive, most precious of colors. <laughs> Nothing else holds a blue. You can't crush blueberries. They turn black. She said, you, you have to have this. And so to use blue um, was also, you know, was particularly distinctive was what she lifted up. So something biological and cosmic. And then what I saw when I was thinking of the baptism was again, here's Jesus coming up out of the waters. Um, the amniotic sac is also called the bag of waters and, and then also kind of coming up out of the blue of, of the cosmos. And I enjoy there's a, if you go to the next image, it's another version of the same icon that I enjoy even more. I didn't have it in as good a resolution. If you can pardon that um, it's, it's also our lady of the sign, but in this version, the scripture passage is around the edge. Mm -hmm. And in this version, not only Jesus is in the coming from with the cosmos around him, as well as the biological birth, but Mary then also is held in that cosmic birth in the blue field. And which I think further emphasizes that. And then also look, look to see the, um, the wings of the angels all around the angels who brought the message, the Lord will give you a sign. Mm -hmm. um, and so the accompaniment of the angels here before Jesus's birth, announcing his coming as God's child. And then the angels in the icon of the baptism, uh, where Jesus hears an, the affirmation of that you are my son, my beloved. And so you start to see the artists working with the story and binding the arc of Jesus' life all together. Jesus is holding a scroll, which maybe suggests that he's the, the word incarnate. Yes. I'm, and, and what's marvelous, and we, uh, we could delve, I mean, there, there's these little discs with letters in them, and those are giving the names of the figures. There are letters around Jesus' head. See how Jesus' halo has a cross in it. Um, there are all these things that when you delve into iconography, uh, you can, each of these things, these symbols is pulling in another piece of the story. And they're, they're profligate, these artists, with the layering and, and the binding together of these things. A question. Yes. It's a, it's a blessing posture, a posture of blessing, uh, which if there, there's all these strands with any of these things in iconography, but in this posture, some have seen the three fingers connected for the three persons of the Trinity and the two fingers raised for the humanity and the divinity of Christ. Um, the, I don't know that the first person who painted it was thinking of that. I'm sure we can't answer that question, but these are layers that get added in to, to see and pray with and pray with God through these images. So I'll take a chance to pause here and say, you know, I know that some of you have 
a lived experience of the presence of angels and their truth in your life as messengers of God's word. And some of you have never experienced an angel and would say, you know, I'm not really sure that I exactly really believe in those. And people with both of those experiences can, can, ha can find parallel fruit in these icons because what they're doing in the image is connecting. You see the angels there at Jesus's conception. You see the angels bringing the word of God and the presence of God's care to Jesus in the wilderness. You, and they do that work, whether whatever your relationship with is with angels, they connect you through Jesus's story. And these, they strengthen, these images strengthen our remembrance that Jesus was claimed by God, held by God. The language is often used adopted by God since before his birth and up into his adulthood through his baptism. So the now one more angel. image. Yes. The word angel simply means messenger in, um, in Greek. So angels aren't just hallmark characters with wings. The wings indicate they're flying back and forth between God and, and us. Um, but that's all, you know, that's not, we see angels appear in the Bible without wings in all sorts of vestiges. So, and, and, um, I was reminded once by one of the monks at SSJE in a sermon, the, in the Bible, you see the people of God, they're never actually surprised that an angel, that a messenger from God arrives. They're terrified, <laughs> but never surprised. The angels always have to say, do not be afraid. Um, but that they would receive a vision, a message from God makes sense to them uh, as a possibility as God's people. So, but the fact that they're terrified keeps them out of Hallmark territory, you know? <laughs> this next image, this one more image, which is known as the inexhaustible chalice. And I've sent this image to most of you at one time or another on the front of a card. I first, when I first saw it, the thing that most first drew me in with delight was this kind of um, Jesus bursting up out of the chalice with a blessing in both hands, you know, ha ha. Mm -hmm. um, I love, I just love the physicality of it. <laughs> but I, I thought of it this week and, and in the context of baptism and the layering of these images, because of something Lyndon said to me, she said, I read, I, I dislike that image. I am not a fan of, of seeing the newborn Christ, this, vulnerable baby and the 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 layering of the image that of his death of him in the blood christ's blood of it at his death in the cup mm -hmm. um that that there's an abruptness there that's uncomfortable and as i looked at it again i had to say yeah th those layers are intimately pressed together in this image and more even uh that they're there's even something of baptism of him coming up out of liquid depths and rising up. And there's something certainly of his death and resurrection that the kind of, if you think of kind of shadowed recesses of the cup and, and out comes Jesus in this image, um, bursting up out of that darkness. And the original painter of this icon is unknown, but I think we can, faithfully assume they knew what they were doing with these layers you know they meditated upon this the creation of this image and they're building on that uh, image our lady of the sign it's clearly a similar thing but instead of the coming of of jesus out of the womb and the cosmos it's the cup and it's still, it's still the womb. but it's still the womb it hasn't ceased being that's right. It's still the womb. Thank you. It, it's it's it, when you know when you have an experience of the many pieces of art, you see all the layers together. And so this artist is saying, look how it's one act, one work of God in Christ. And and actually, this icon it hung in obscurity um, in a convent hallway for for who knows how long. And as they say, it appeared in its fullness when a alcoholic soldier had a vision from God who said, come and find the inexhaustible cup 
at this monastery, at this convent. And he was so sick in his illness, he crawled to the convent and inquired after the this painting of the inexhaustible cup. And they said, well, I'm sorry, that's we don't have one of those. Um, and until one of the sisters remembered, oh, in the hallway, there's a hallway where there's a painting hanging. And, and he came there and they turned it over and on the back, it said the inexhaustible cup to their surprise. And he had been called in this vision to, and, and this is so characteristic of when you read the, of, of Christian life journeys in Eastern Christianity, the, the visions and the journey, the pilgrimages and um, images found and faith, faith renewed through these kinds of journeys. But he was invited in to, to do a, a devotion, a, a lengthy devotion with this piece of art. And in that stood up into his sobriety. And many people have done so since with this image. And so even in its, in its appearance, its discovery as a way of praying with God, this image has very, you know, viscerally the, a journey through death and resurrection and only an image that went to that place uh, of naming that part of what Jesus did was to die and to rise could be helpful to a person in that position of life in life in, in right. to any of us passing through our death and into resurrection. So what Jesus' disciples came to understand about his baptism, clearly in the scriptures, is that as he rose up from the waters and heard that blessing, you are my child, my beloved, with you I am well pleased, that as he accepted that he was God's son, he, accepted, he was accepting love that had been and love that would be. He was accepting a love that bathed all the hardships that his parents had gone through and his ancestors and a love that would bathe all the hardships ahead in his life and that would redeem those hardships. So all the actions and the meaning of Jesus' life then become visible. If we go, if you were to turn back to that first icon of, of his baptism, you know, all the work of Jesus becomes visible in that moment of baptism. It's, you might call that shorthand, or you might call it poetry, or you might just call it reality. And so this recognition and our thanksgiving for this has given birth to these all these other images of how that love is at work. If you turn, uh, there's one by Andrew Vinichok. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. And look how the waters themselves are cross-shaped. And then one by Daniel Bonnell and Christ has this, this in, on the one hand, a strong, a diver's posture, uh, embracing the waters and going into them with gusto, but on the other hand, a posture of crucifixion, both happening at the same time. But this image by Olga Shalomova. The moment of Jesus' baptism here, I see, this seems to evoke particularly the, the kind of disjunction of linear space and time at the moment of Christ's baptism, that the cosmic meaning of this event or the cosmic truth that's revealed in his baptism. Or the next image from Greta Maria Lesko um, this one seems to go even farther in that direction of the cosmic. It really evokes to me the words of our first scripture today that Shelley read. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep. And God separated the day from the night. Or in the next piece of that scripture, the God separated the waters below from the waters above the dome. I know that, that not every image here will have appealed to your particular artistic sense, right? But do you see theologically how in exploring theologically, these are masterpieces of storytelling and discovery and saying what might be through Jesus' baptism? 
there's a reason why baptism becomes the entry into the Christian church. We, we take Eucharist week by week and it sustains us and we're, we're renewed, but there is one baptism and it's the one universal baptism by which like it or not, we are, you know, revel in it one day and struggle with it the next. We are united to every Christian everywhere on earth. Because through our baptism, the day of our baptism, but every time we renew ourselves in our baptism, every time we turn the eyes of our heart back to our baptism, we're able to put on all of the gifts of Christ for us, just as that day is connected to his whole ministry. In our baptism, we are connected to our eternal cosmic belovedness. We stand up in our adoption by God, wherever we have come from. There's the mixture of the biological and the cosmic importance in our lives. And there is in baptism, the accompaniment of Christ through life, through death and into resurrection to burst back into life. It, it's possible to sort of end there and it could, our own lives include rosy times and difficult times but it could be possible to end there and see the baptismal image as especially just about God's love for us and our love back towards God. But Jesus baptism also sent him out to his neighbors, right? And the, if the first commandment and the greatest commandment is this to love God with all your heart and all your soul and your mind, the second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself and our baptismal promises that we'll renew in just a minute, they draw us out into that space of love for neighbor. So these last couple images that I'll show, they may seem at first to have nothing to do with baptism, but they are images that are about that, what, what baptism sends you out to do. These artists may be asking us how rich has your baptismal imagination yet become? Can you feel the baptismal desire of God in this place, in this person? Can you see God's beloved child here in this face? So we turn and we'll just quietly contemplate this series of the next three images. the paper at the times yes, yes. Mm -hmm. my friends in Christ may the art of our ancestors and our contemporaries help us to come closer to Jesus's own life to our own belovedness by God and may the art that is still being produced and that that maybe you will produce, help us grow yet further into our love of neighbor in our baptisms. Let us turn and renew our baptismal promises. <laughs> 